Some of you are old enough to remember the magic eye craze. For those of you who don't remember or those of you who are too young, let me explain it. Uh, I first encountered the phenomenon when I was in a mall in Manila about 20 years ago. And there were all these people crowded around a bookstore window. And every now and then one would scream in excitement and say, I see it. And the next one would come up and another one would say, I see it. I had no idea what they were seeing. And so when the crowd thinned out, I looked and there was this poster. And it was nonsense. It didn't really look like anything. And I looked at it and I didn't see it. Later on, someone gave me a book of magic eye pictures. There were maybe 20 of them and every page was another one and I still didn't see it. Finally, someone showed me how it worked and I saw it. What I saw was a beautiful 3D picture of this mountain landscape and the next page, there was a 3D picture. It was a Disney character. I don't remember which one. The next page was a 3D picture. It didn't look like it, but I finally saw it of a bear. And the artwork was amazing when those 3D pictures would pop out. Now, what does that have to do with leadership development? A lot of us don't see the potential leaders that we're surrounded with. A lot of us feel like we have a leadership shortage at all levels of our organization, but I'm here to tell you, you don't have a leadership shortage. It might be a sight problem. It might be that you don't see it. And I wanna to talk today about a way to see not perfect leaders, but potential leaders. And if we'll start thinking in terms of potential leaders, not perfected leaders, if we start thinking in terms of future leaders who simply need some development, not leaders who are already functioning and we can just hire them from somewhere else. I have felt the leadership shortage so many times in a growing church, in a growing campus ministry, in a growing global ministry, but I'm convinced that we have all the leaders we need if we'll just see correctly, if we'll start looking at the potential and the future and not at the past and not at the current, it's amazing how many leaders we'll find around us. Yesterday, during lunch with Kevin York and Jim LaFoon, we were talking about leadership development and specifically leadership transition. And, and, and as our discussion rolled out, there are a couple of mega churches in America, some very influential, huge, great churches that are in leadership transition. And they're looking outside to try to fill those roles. Our office here in Nashville gets requests constantly. Right now, there are five offerings on the table asking us to help some of our churches find worship pastors or worship leaders. Um, there are another couple of situations that I know of where large churches, big churches, are again looking outside for two basic staff positions to be filled. Now, I'm not here to say that every single hire that's outside of your own local situation is bad, but I am here to say that our norm, that the routine should be to raise up leaders from within. I think sometimes we assume there's a lack of leadership because we're looking at our people in the wrong way and we're looking for the wrong thing. Too often in ministry, we think we have a leadership shortage, but in reality, what's happened is we have failed to identify potential leaders. It's not a leadership shortage, it's a failure to identify. Also, we think we have a leadership shortage when we fail to develop future leaders. And we have a leadership shortage when we fail to empower current leaders. If we will simply empower our current leaders, develop our future leaders, but all that starts with identifying potential leaders. When we do that, we'll see we really don't have a leadership shortage. We're looking at that picture the wrong way. The magic eye works when we think about potential leaders, not perfect leaders. Problem so often is we're looking for leaders who are already perfected, they're already mature, they're already functioning. Those don't exist except somewhere else. But within our own context, there are plenty of potential leaders waiting to be developed, waiting to be trained, waiting to be mentored, waiting to be empowered so they can make all the same mistakes we made when we were new leaders. But when we think things have to be perfect, 
we will never develop the kind of leaders that can multiply and multiply and multiply in our context, around our nation, and around the nations. So how do we do this? I can think about a number of years ago in Manila when we were, our, our discipleship was causing a lot of growth, but our leadership development was lagging behind. The more we made disciples, the more the churches and the campus ministries grew, but we weren't keeping pace with new leaders. And so after a time of soul searching, looking back in our history at times when we had more than enough leaders, we created a strategy based on what we had done successfully before. And it came to be known as the four eyes. It was the four eyes because when we created all these categories of things that we did that were successful in leadership multiplication, we had big sticky notes all over the wall and we put them in groups. I think it was June Escasar who labeled those groups, what became the four eyes. Identification was one big group. Another group, he said, hey, all this looks like instruction and teaching. And this group all had to do with impartation and the other group had to do with internship. So the four eyes. We start with identification, the who. Who are we trying to develop as a leader? And what we're identifying, again, it's not ready-made leaders, but it's potential leaders. It's future leaders, not perfected leaders, not leaders who are already functioning in the highest levels of leadership. If we're looking for that, we're always going to feel like we have a leadership shortage. But if we look for potential and we look for a future leader, then our pathway is clear. So what am I actually looking for when I think about a future leader? All right, here it is. We're looking for faith, F-A-I-T-H. If you have a leadership shortage, no matter what level of your ministry, your organization, your church, whatever it is, start by looking for those who are faithfully following Christ. This is ministry. The start point is someone who faithfully follows Christ. They're all in with their walk with Jesus. That's the starting point in Matthew chapter four. Follow me and I'll do these other things. I'll develop the other aspects of your life. But it starts with following Jesus. A, available. Are they following Christ? Number two, are they available right now to invest more into the ministry and invest more into training before they're paid, before they have a title, before they have a position? If they're not available, maybe it's because of proximity where they live. Maybe it's because of the job they have and the lack of time that's available for ministry. I don't know what it is, but someone has to have some level of availability or we can't take them to the next level of leadership. So are they faithfully following Christ? Are they available to serve in ministry? Thirdly, are they involved? Involved. If you're looking for someone to take over your kid's ministry, the starting point is to look for someone who's already involved in kid's ministry. If you're looking for a worship leader, the answer is not to look at another church. Look at who's already involved in your worship ministry. Whatever it is and whatever kind of leader you're looking for, the starting point is finding those who are already involved in doing that. Now, can they lead that whole thing? Probably not now, but you're looking for the potential and the future of one who is involved. Are they faithfully following Jesus? Are they available to serve in ministry? Are they already involved in doing whatever you want to hire them to do? And fourth, T, are they teachable? You can never be too ignorant or too unlearned to be used by God, but you can know too much. There are some people who are too smart to be used by God because they think they have all the answers. The real question is not, do you have all the answers? The real question is, are you teachable? When I was a new Christian and the youth pastor was discipling me at First Presbyterian Church, it seems like every time I asked him a question, he wouldn't answer it. I used to wonder if he actually had any answers, but now I think he was just a brilliant disciple maker. And I would ask a question and he would say, Steve, that's a good question. I bet if you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you'll find the answer. So I would read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I would find another question, but I wouldn't find an answer, and I would ask him that question. He'd say, I bet if you read the book of Ephesians, you'll find the answer. You know, this youth pastor never answered any of my questions. He just pointed me to the Word. 
He was trying to teach me how to be teachable and he didn't feel like he had to have all the answers. If you don't have all the answers, that's okay as long as you're teachable. So the person who was a potential leader in your area, are they teachable? And then finally, H, are they hungry for more or are they just content where they are? You've got to have a hunger. So I'm asking these questions. Are they faithfully following Jesus? Are they available for more service? Are they involved already before they get a title and before they're paid? Are they teachable and trainable or do they know, already know everything? And are they hungry for more of God and more of ministry? It doesn't matter if they're great leaders now, but if they answer all those questions correctly, I have a potential leader. I have a future leader I can work with. So now that we've identified our potential, our future leaders, now we need to bring instruction. I remember years ago, um, there was a person, an American missionary in the Philippines, and this person was the president of a ministry that put Bible schools all over Asia. Great ministry. They did a wonderful job training leaders. And, and he and his family were members of our church, but his ministry was outside of our ministry. And it was a great, really did a great job. He noticed so many strong Filipino leaders in our church. And he asked me, Steve, what is the curriculum you use? What is the material you use for discipleship and leadership development? And I honestly, I wasn't trying to be uh, super spiritual or I wasn't trying to withhold information. I looked at him, I thought of him, and I said, well, it's the Bible. And he said, no, 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 you use the Bible, but what is the course? And the truth is at that point, we didn't have Leadership 215. We didn't have Every Nation Seminary. We didn't even have the Purple Book. We had a Bible. And that really was what we used for discipleship and leadership development, the Bible. Imagine that, training ministry leaders by using the Bible. And so I wanna tell you, when we talk about instruction, really this Bible is what you need. If you have other things, other books, other courses, that's, that's a supplement, but it's only useful to the degree that it's biblical. I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and it says, all scripture, all of it, is breathed out by God and profitable. So all scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And that's what leaders need. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And isn't that the goal? That leaders are complete, they're trained in righteousness, they're ready for every good work. And what the scripture says of itself is that's what scripture does. So when you think about instruction, while there are good wisdom books out there and methodology and leadership and management and whatever else, ultimately we develop leaders by developing them in scripture, in God's word. That's what's going to shape not only their mind, but their hearts and their ministry skills and make them useful for every good work in the kingdom. Next, we wanna talk about impartation. And impartation, if instruction has to do with the head, bringing the information, impartation has to do with the heart, bringing formation to the heart, forming the type of heart that God can use mightily in his purpose. I'm reminded of Romans 1, 11, and 12. You know, Paul wrote letters from prison. He wrote letters from different cities and he sent those letters of instruction. There were theological instruction, there was practical church life instruction, there were all kinds of instruction. And the point is that Paul could instruct people from a distance, and he often did. During, during the pandemic, the global pandemic and COVID, um, a lot of instruction happened through Zoom, through, um, through YouTube, through Facebook Live and other, other technological uh, platforms because we couldn't meet face to face. Instruction still happened, teaching still happened. But look what Paul says in Romans 1, 11 and 12. He says, I long to see you. He had been sending letters, and actually this is a letter we're reading in Romans 1, 11, 12. I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So what Paul says is he wasn't face to face, he wasn't in the city, 
But he said, I long to be there with you face to face that I might impart. Again, he could instruct from a distance, but there was something about impartation that required close proximity. Something about uh, the impartation into the heart. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, for this reason, Paul writing Timothy, for this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Again, you can't lay hands on someone from a distance. You can instruct through a letter. Now we do it through video like we're doing now. But there is this impartation thing of being face to face to lay hands. In fact, we're told in Hebrews chapter 6, that the laying on of hands is one of the foundations of the church, along with faith in God and repentance from dead works and, uh, and, and uh, other foundations, but that proximity, that laying on of hands. Numbers chapter 11 paints a picture of what we're talking about with impartation. I want to read verses 24 and 25 to get the picture from the Old Testament of this idea of impartation. It says, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. There's that proximity. Verse 25. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took, watch this, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. Now, this was an idea of impartation, that what the spirit that was in Moses, God put it on the 70. Now, none of us are pretending to be Moses. There's one Moses. There was one Moses. That's not us. But that idea of impartation from one to another. I think about John 13, the power of impartation. You know the story. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. It shocks them. They don't want him to do it because that's the lowliest place of a servant, of a slave, of the, of the, not a leader. A leader would never do that. A servant. Jesus washes their feet. And I believe something was imparted to them. He could have preached a thousand sermons on serving and it wouldn't have had the impact the impartation into their hearts, the conviction and the reforming of their hearts that happened when Jesus actually got down on his knees with a towel on his arm and washed their dirty feet. You get the picture of impartation. If you want to develop leaders, you start with identifying potential leaders, not finding ready-made leaders and trying to hire them from somewhere else, identifying the potential. Then you bring that instruction from God's word and then there has to be proximity, time together, relational depth, that shapes the heart and demonstrates by example what we've been teaching and what we've been living. And that brings us to internship. Internship is basically on the job training. The corporate world has internship. They're usually formalized. And unfortunately in the corporate world, internship usually is someone who does all of the menial task and they're there temporarily. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think larger than that when I talk about in a spiritual mentoring sense of internship. It's really a shared ministry. It's an on-the-job training. It's when people are allowed under close supervision to do big kingdom things that on their own maybe they couldn't. And it, and it gives us a chance to see whether a person can carry the weight of the ministry whether they can do the work of the ministry and what are the results of that. And often it gives us an opportunity, that internship time, that on-the-job training, it gives us an opportunity to see where we can adjust and where we can recalibrate and where we can, we can make some, um, some corrections mid-course uh, that we don't get that opportunity sometimes when we're just focused on only the instruction side of it. So we get out of the classroom, we get out of the teaching mode, and we got to actually do ministry and do leadership together in an internship. Again, it can be formal or informal. Most of the time, it's informal. I want to look at one more scripture before we close this message in Psalm 78. Very familiar scripture about leadership. I've talked about it a lot. At the end of Psalm 78, it covers a lot of what we've talked about here. 
verse 70. It says, he chose David his servant. That's that identification. It's, it's, it's something that came from God. God makes some people and gifts, gives them giftings and wirings and opportunities in this type of leadership or that type. And we've got to recognize what God has done. God chose David, his servant. He took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes and brought him to shepherd his people, Jacob. But watch this, verse 72. With upright heart, he shepherded them. That's the impartation side. It shapes our heart and guided them with skillful hands. That's that internship part, the skillful hands, upright heart, skillful hands. Ultimately, that's what we're looking for in this leadership development process and this empowering these potential leaders, these future leaders. A few minutes ago, we talked about those 3D images, those magic eye posters and books and pictures where a 3D picture was hidden in what looks sometimes like jumbled nonsense of a picture. When I finally learned how to do it, it's because someone explained to me, and here's what they said. If you will get the book or the picture and put it really close to your face and focus, and then you start moving it further and further away, and eventually that picture pops out. I think leadership development is sort of like that. I think finding potential, I think finding future leaders, we look at them close. And I think when we look at these leaders really closely, we see all the problems and it doesn't look like there's a lot of potential leadership. But when we kind of back up and see a big picture, I think we can see potential. Listen, the bottom line is when we talk about leadership development, I know it feels like there's a leadership shortage. I'm saying there's not. There's not a shortage of potential leaders. There is not a shortage of future leaders. And there's not a shortage of current leaders who could be empowered at a greater level. There's probably a shortage of perfect leaders, of leaders who are ready to go right now. But that's not what we're looking for. To solve your leadership shortage, look for potential leaders. Develop future leaders empower your current leaders, and you'll be amazed at what God does through them.